Thank you much, sir. Yeah, any word but no. That's the word you're not supposed to say about retrovirus. That's, uh, that's the one word that doesn't fly too well. So by all, by all criteria, by all standards, AIDS has been a dismal failure in the last 10 years. We have invested into this, into the virus hypothesis and in AIDS. By now, the American taxpayer alone $35 billion. That doesn't include other countries investments or the companies that have paid into it. We have employed about 100,000 scientists who are meeting annually, now biannually, at international conferences in between at private conferences. And we have, despite all these enormous efforts, not come up with anything that is beneficial to the AIDS patients or to the taxpayer. Not one vaccine has been developed no talk is available, no medicine, not even an effective prevention. The education on safe sex and clean needles has not been able to slow down the spread of AIDS. There's no evidence that this works at all. And this is not an accident, as I said. We have tried as hard as we could. And if a hypothesis is so consistently unsuccessful, producing no benefits whatsoever, then it is a rule in science that you have to reconsider that hypothesis. That is the scientific method. You, you look at a situation, make a hypothesis, do experiments or do predictions. And if as an epidemiologist or also as an experimental scientist, you can make predictions. If these predictions do not come out right or nothing works, then you ask your graduate student or yourself, if you're still a scientist, could it be that my hypothesis was wrong and I have to reconsider? rather than saying we need more money to work further on this hypothesis. Even so now, 10 years after AIDS, a doctor cannot tell you at all what's going to happen. Let's say you had a wild party today or yesterday night, you forgot your condoms and you forgot your clean needles. So you go to the doctor and say, I forgot my condoms, my clean needles, we had a great time last night. What's going to happen? He said, well, first, I can't tell you now. You have to come back in a couple of months and then we, we do an antibody test because it doesn't go so fast. So then he does an antibody test and let's say it's positive. You say, doctor, now what's going to happen? He said, can't tell you now, but any decade from now, <laughs> you might develop diarrhea, dementia, Kaposi sarcoma, pneumonia, herpes infection, or cervical cancer, if you have a cervix, of course. <laughs> and all of these are AIDS diseases. That's all you can say, but it could just as well that you might live another 50 years and you'll be then what's now called a long-term survivor or a non progressor All of these possibilities is virtually nothing can be predicted and nothing can be done about it. Now, as I said, this is a classical situation for where the scientific method should ask, did we make a mistake at the first place? And I'm submitting today that the, perhaps the first mistake was made that we did not consider alternative causes of AIDS, but this virus. This virus was established as a cause for the scientific community at least, not in the scientific lit literature, not at a scientific conference, but at a press conference in Washington by the, what's now and still, still now referred to as the nation's leading virus researcher, Robert Gallo, and the Secretary of Health and Human Services. They announced at an international press conference the cause of AIDS had been found, or the probable cause of AIDS had been found, and the next morning it was called the AIDS virus by the New York Times and by the Washington Post and by all other docile mainstream media ever since, and including all of scientists. From then on, all funding from the federal government, which is by now seven and a half billion a year, including treatment, was completely predicated on this hypothesis. If you asked for money to study alternative causes, they would say uh, this is a uh, a uh, waste of money, we cannot afford that, it's an urgent battle, we cannot play around with theories now, we have to, uh, we have to carry buckets to the fire, you have to work fast now in order to, uh, to contribute, but if you want to ask questions, we know the cause, Dr. Gallo knows the cause, the nation knows the cause, and that had decided 
that uh, the decision was made and it, there was no alternative science anymore. Science had closed the doors on, on, in, on other inquiry. Now, have we made the right decision when we decided it was infectious? And here, this is what I would like to discuss first. There are criteria, classical criteria that is, to identify or tell apart an infectious disease from a non-infectious disease. And if you apply those criteria, you will see AIDS does not even meet one of the classical criteria of an infectious disease, not even one. And here I have some of these on, let me see if I could have the first or the second slide. That, as you possibly recall, both Barbara, uh, both um, Margaret Heckler and, and Gallo announced at this famous press conference that within two years a vaccine would be available, which is of course what you would predict if a virus were the cause, and that unless this vaccine comes by that time, AIDS would explode into the general population. Well, what they meant is the classical behavior of an infectious agent coming into a new population. Perhaps some of you recall the history books when the Californian Indians were first discovered by the white men, mostly uh, fathers and holy men coming from Mexico or from Spain to teach them to read the Bible and to build missions, 90% of the Indians died within a year from syphilis and tuberculosis. They knew how to read the Bible and to pray, but most of them didn't enjoy the results of it because they had gotten syphilis and tuberculosis from the holy men who taught them how to read the Bible. <laughs> that took only about less than a year. The same thing happened to the Eskimos, and the same thing happened to the Hawaiians. Well, what, what that reflects is, is a law in ep epidemiology that's called FAR's law, F-A-R-R, -A, -R, a British epidemiologist who first described the behavior of, a, of an infectious agent in populations, that it goes up exponentially like a seasonal flu, seasonal flu in a bell curve and then disappears again. But that is not what happened about AIDS, although this is what Gallo and Heckler correctly predicted if it had been a new infectious agent, sexually transmitted, that should have happened in the American population or in the population of the world. But it didn't. AIDS even now is still in exactly the same risk group as it was uh, 10 years ago. So okay, let's see, I, I go through some of them. I have a couple of um, here. Um, see, this is the explosion argument I just made that AIDS should explode outside the risk groups because and AIDS sex is not just a prerogative of male homosexuals and intravenous drug users. There's circumstantial evidence that heterosexuals in America still practice sex. <laughs> one one ev piece of circumstantial evidence is four million babies that are born. Uh, another is uh, documentation in, 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 uh, in, highly, uh, in, in very popular magazines like Penthouse or, or uh, Playboy. So se uh, heterosexual sex is alive, prostitution is alive, porno movies are made, yet there is no AIDS in heterosexuals. Something is wrong here with the hypothesis. AIDS has remained, is 90% male, and of those males, one third are intravenous drug users, as the CDC uh, records faithfully, and roughly 60% are male homosexuals, and these are not your all-American male homosexuals from next door. These are male homosexuals who have an enviable party life. They have so-called fast-track homosexuals who have on average uh, sometimes 300 partners per year. And we'll go through the evidence what that means to AIDS. Could I have the next slide please? So that prediction didn't, didn't come out. Another one was, of course, that healthcare workers, those brave soldiers in the front line against fighting in the front lines against the deadly virus would be of course dying like the doctors who try who treated the cholera <coughs> patients described in Albert Camus famous novel The Plague that he wrote like 40 or 50 years ago describing a cholera epidemic in North Africa they would be of course they would be the heroes who would die first because we don't have a vaccine we don't have a drug and they are treating AIDS patients they're getting in all sorts of contacts with them injections surgery, burial, washing them. Well, there is not, there are now, in the meantime, we have 400,000, and we have 400,000 AIDS patients in this country in 10 years, and believe it or not, everybody is afraid of an infectious disease. People wear condoms and gloves and gas masks, and, in, and even every dentist uh, wears a mask. But if you look 
up the literature of the over 100,000 papers produced on the subject, you will not find one single documented case, I'm saying not even one, of a doctor or a healthcare worker ever gotten uh, contracting AIDS from his or her patient in 10 years in this country. And these must be at least 400, 500,000 doctors because that's the number of patients who had developed AIDS in this country in 10 years. There's not even one. And that is called the epidemic, the infectious epidemic of the 20th century. Not even one doctor or healthcare worker ever got AIDS from this deadly virus and the, treating their patients. Now, of course, you may argue it's only sexually transmitted, but as, you, uh, as we go over this, even that is occasionally happening between a doctor and his or her patient, and that hasn't helped either. There's no, the only doctors who ever developed AIDS turned out to be either intravenous drug users or male homosexuals practicing so-called risk behavior on their own. So AIDS uh, does not look infectious by that criterion at all. It, in fact, you could, li occasionally people cite a case here and then, but you'll get these cases, excuse me, yes? Sorry, are you including needle stick injury and uh, needle stick injury? Yes, I include those too. There are needle stick transmissions of HIV, which the press and also the docile public have, have learned in years of education to equate that HIV is AIDS. Yes, HIV is a virus, it is a retrovirus, it is a very profoundly conventional retrovirus. Very inactive, hard to transmit because they are mostly latent. They are naturally transmitted from mother to child. Not horizontally, as we say, from partner to partner, or person to person, or animal to animal. So that has happened. HIV has been transmitted, but AIDS did not follow. What did the people in the uh, uh, Acre case die of? In, in what place? In? Sorry, Acer or Acre. Oh, the ACA, the, oh, the, the, the dentist patients. I, I come to that if, in a minute. Thank you. Mm. They, they died, um, the Kimberly Begalis, the most famous case to make it very brief here, from ACT treatment. When you're antibody positive, then you get the self-fulfilling prophecy. You get treated with ACT. ACT is, a, I come back to it in a minute, I have some d data on it here, is a chemotherapy that kills coring cells if you are under chemotherapy, you develop AIDS diseases plus other diseases and you die and that's what happened to her and happened to many others. So then you can get, uh, you can get AIDS by prescription. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what you do. I mean, this is not even a joke. That is uh, unfortunately the case here. So another, another example would be the 15 to 20,000 HIV workers like Bob Robert Gallo and these heroes who fight the virus in their laboratories every day and mass produce it for AIDS testing, not one of these heroic scientists have ever, f uh, have ever paid with their lives or even with an AIDS disease for fighting this deadly virus for 15 or 20 years. And we know they are not known for their uh, tidiness altogether. I mean, when the, when, the, when, the, uh, when the Commission for Scientific Integrity tried to find out where, vi where Gallo's virus came from, whether it came from a patient or came from the mailbox from a friend in, in, in France, it took him three years to sift through the data and nobody could ever found four people in his lab were indicted for fraud and embezzlement, but they couldn't find the records where the virus came from. Uh, some people in that lab had children with each other, even apparently while working uh, together, but nobody ever developed AIDS from that deadly virus that was all over the place. Interesting virus, I mean, it's very selective. It doesn't touch scientists, it doesn't touch doctors but it's rather poodle on homosexuals and IV drug users. So that prediction didn't come true. Could I have the next one, please? That's a, here's another prediction that you would make. Well, chimpanzees had been inoculated. That is a, a classical test. Robert Koch postulates, for example, the father who, of infectious disease, the man who isolated the tubercle bacillus. He laid down some rules and by which to identify a, sus a, sus a suspect microbe as a cause of disease. He says you have to cause the disease by injecting it into a susceptible animal or human. In this case, chimpanzees were chosen. That's the closest to human. And 150 chimpanzees have been inoculated since uh, we know the AIDS virus. And all of them do really well eating bananas and waiting. They're all long-term survivors at this point at $50,000 a piece per year. They're more expensive than a postdoc. This thing. Um, uh, we have also done a human experiment, a human experiment at the American 
Uh, doctors, unknowingly of course, have inoculated 15,000 American hemophiliacs. 75% of all hemophiliacs in America are HIV positive. All of them carry the deadly virus for over 10 years now. What is the result? Their median lifespan has doubled in the last 12 years. <laughs> it is completely correct. Uh, this is, so you could make an argument if you're just a scientist now, I'm not trying to make jokes unnecessarily, but you could make a logical argument, HIV has doubled the lifespan of hemophiliacs. Yeah, well, you have, if, you, if it's a quick tech, technical, it's okay. Uh, you're begging a technical question here. The point is that 25% of them could have died without changing the median lifespan. So your statistic is very powerful, but it doesn't refute mm -hmm. a claim that many hemophiliacs will die of AIDS. Well, um, they will die of AIDS because we have now 30 diseases in the presence of HIV are called AIDS, and it's hardly possible to to, uh, to die from many others anymore. Unless it's pre breast cancer and a few others, they're not called AIDS yet. So cervical cancer and hemophiliacs tend to be male. So they, they ha uh, it's very likely that they will die from some AIDS disease. We have added 30 diseases to this list now. Do you know how many hemophiliacs have died of AIDS, whether they be a proper description or not? Yes, yes, roughly uh, uh, one and a half to two percent per year die with AIDS-defining diseases. But see, Hemophiliacs have one thing in common with the rest of us, they're not immortal. <laughs> we all die. Uh, in any population you look at, one and a half percent per year is going to die because hardly anybody gets over 100 years old, except that would tell her and me, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> next one, please. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, now, another one is that viruses cause the same disease in people. You know, this is why, this is it, viruses, in a sense, are pretty much like a musical instrument. And a piano sounds like a piano in Africa and in America and Germany. It does may sound a tiny bit different, but you'll tell it, you can tell it from a, a from a, a fiddle or from a bell. And this is why viruses their their behavior is encoded in their genetic information. A polio virus will cause pretty much the same disease in Central Africa, in Kentucky in Paris or in Edinburgh and this but not with HIV and AIDS. HIV causes country specific diseases and in fact risk group specific diseases. In Africa AIDS is a heterosexual epidemic and it, the diseases are tuberculosis mostly, weight loss and what they call slim disease. It's a combination of chronic fever, diarrhea and things like that. Pneumocystis is never mentioned, Kaposi hardly ever enters the statistics. In America it's pneumocystis pneumonia, in Africa it's men and women alike, in America and in Europe it's mostly men. So that kind of uh, host uh, diff variation has never been seen before in any virus or any microbe. If it were so, we would have never named a hepatitis virus a hepatitis virus or syphilis, for that matter, a syphilis bacterium, because we can diagnose their behavior or predict their behavior from uh, the uh, from the encoded information in these microbes. They have a predictable behavior, but not HIV and AIDS. It failed that criteria. Could I have the next one, please? And now uh, another violation of the rule that came from the very beginning that nobody seemed to notice or, or f except a few people. They said, hey, the only thing that Gallo and these people ever find in AIDS patients is not the virus, but antibody against the virus. And until Gallo, which was sort of a new turning point in biological sciences, until then, for 200 years prior to Gallo, uh, the, it, the rule was that antibodies protect against virus and against viruses. Ever since Edward Jenner discovered the principle of vaccination, the one thing you wanted to have against viruses, about viruses, is antibodies against it. Not the viruses, but antibodies against it. That's the only weapon against viral disease, the only protection. In fact, for that very reason, you were sent to your doctor when you were young to be artificially infected by attenuated strains of polio, measles, mumps, and many other viruses and microbes to make just exactly those antibodies against these viruses so that you wouldn't get a disease again. The prediction is the antibodies predict the protection, sometimes lifetime protection and often very complete protection, 
And here we were saying just the opposite. You were saying Gallo was and the world followed him with it. When you have antibodies against the virus and only then are you in trouble. Now, 10 years from now, any decade now, you get diarrhea, dementia, Kaposi sarcoma, or pneumonia. There's no other microbe, no exception, where we make a prediction based on immunity. In fact, we make predictions of what's going to happen just on the opposite, on the absence of immunity. If you fail to make antibodies, if you don't have antibodies and you want to go to Mexico, every doctor will tell you, you need a new shot, <laughs> yellow fever, salmonella, what else, so you could be protected. Not with antibodies against HIV. When you make antibodies to that virus, then and only then do all doctors in the world now tell you, now you're in trouble, my friend. But at the same time, they don't want to, you know, they want to eat their cake too. They say, give us a couple of billion dollars a year to develop that vaccine, which was promised for 1986 and is now promised like the latent period of the virus, always another year later. Now they're saying about 10 years from now. And at seven billion, seven and a half billion a year, I wouldn't rush it either. It's not a bad, uh, it's not a bad plan to work it out very, very carefully. Except there is no evidence that even the best vaccine developed by Robert Gallo, that's what he promised to do now in a private institution or in the University of Baltimore and others, is going to do any better than the antibodies that are found in AIDS patients. These antibodies do so well that Gallo, Robin Weiss and leading AIDS researchers in the world have a hell of a time finding that virus. Most of them ended up borrowing it from each other and patented it anyway in their name which is not a bad idea because uh, if you do 25 million AIDS tests a year, as we do in this country, at $50 a piece, it's not a bad idea to have a virus in your name and patent it. Even if you just get one penny from it, you have 25 million pe uh, pennies a year. It's not a bad income on the side. All right, next one, please. So this is um, the AIDS is said to, HIV is said to cause AIDS by killing T cells, but the same people who have made that hypothesis I have patented also in 1984 in the same months uh, with the US patent office have signed under oath well um, we can mass produce that virus for the, vac for the AIDS test. The AIDS test is actually measuring not viruses I just pointed out but antibodies against the virus in your blood. So how do you measure antibodies? You have to have the antigen that is you have to call the virus and Gallo said I can produce that better than anybody else. Robin Weiss in England for the United Kingdom did the same thing, Montagnier in France. They mass produce it in T cells. The same T cells that it's said to kill in the human body are not killed when they are in laboratories mass producing the virus, a titus that are never achieved in the human body. These same cells, uh, they are still growing, producing virus at the same time in these companies and laboratories that Gallo has patented. That is the typical behavior of a retrovirus. Most viruses do not behave that way. They do indeed kill cells in which they are produced. But retroviruses are perhaps the only animal viruses that do not kill a cell for a living. In fact, their role is to coexist with the cell. They are essentially genetic parasites of the cell. That is the very reason why most of us, Duisburg and Gallo and Baltimore and Temin and Bishop and Vamos included in this country have chased them for so many years as possible viral carcinogens, agents that could cause cancer. That was the primary candidate for a virus cancer program that cost almost as much as the AIDS program and has produced very little so far. The same people who are chasing the virus now as a cause of AIDS. The only problem with the transition from chasing retroviruses as causes of cancer to causes of AIDS was to make that very fundamental adjustment. Um, namely, we had all agreed that retroviruses are such plausible carcinogens because they do not kill cells. Therefore, they could possibly cause cancer. Since that didn't happen, we said now, well, since we have invested so much in them, let's do something with them after all. Let's assume they kill cells after all, and then they could cause AIDS. And that is what was the official view when it was published in Science and is now. It's said to be a T-cell killer. But when you ask how is it mass produced, you'll find out it's growing in T-cells that you can get from laboratories now, can grow yourself if you want, and these cells do not die from the virus. The HIV behaves like any other retrovirus. So that prediction didn't turn out uh, to be right either. Could I have uh, and one more or so? And let me see, I have, 
yeah, that's essentially, well, that's a point I'm, uh, that is perhaps good to point out now. Um, even if you, the, I made the point earlier that each of, that viruses typically are characterized, and by bacteria likewise, by the disease they cause. They are programmed genetically to do one thing or to have a target somewhere in the body. That's why a flu virus doesn't cause diarrhea and the polio virus doesn't cause a hepatitis because they have all their, their specific tropism. They know where to go and what to do in the cell. So, because, <coughs> but AIDS is now 30 old diseases under a new name and people say, well, this is possible for that virus to have this huge repertoire uh, not playing the role of a specific instrument, but sounding in fact like a big orchestra with hundreds of instruments, the virus that with the broadest range of diseases possible, because this virus doesn't cause a disease directly, it knocks out the immune system. And when the immune system is gone, then it's like leaving the door open on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, uh, you can get, uh, anything can come in. This could be a student, it could be a street person, it could be a terrorist, or it could be anything. Yes. So uh, doesn't that make a lot of sense? Well, at, in a first approximation it does. The only problem is, of course, it doesn't kill T cells, but let's turn a blind eye to that problem for a moment and assume it does in some magic way that has yet to be figured out for seven and a half billion a, month, uh, a year, you wouldn't rush it anyway. But let's say we, we had figured that out someday, that it, how, it how it causes T cell deficiency, uh, cells that it doesn't infect. Is it, is it true then that everything else would now follow like the open door on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley? Well, the problem is it isn't. Because about 40% of the AIDS diseases in America have nothing to do with immunodeficiency whatsoever. Nothing at all. And I think I have, well, I have listed them here. Let's see, I may have the table in the following. Uh, check me in. Yeah, here they are. All right, so 61% of the AIDS diseases in America are, in fact, what you would call immunodeficiency diseases. They are mm -hmm. microbial diseases. In the, if the immune system fails, it is indeed like leaving the door open on Telegraph Avenue. It could be pneumocystis or pneumonia coming in, candidiasis, mycobacterial infection, tuberculosis, cytomegalo, toxoplasmosis, herpes. These are all fungal, bacterial, or viral microbes that could march in. These are typical consequences of a failing immune system. Then any microbe will grow in you like a Swiss cheese or like a camembert, the local flavor will be maintained. Now, but this explains only 61% of the AIDS diseases in America. A full 39% have nothing to do with immunodeficiency whatsoever. The best known of these is Kaposi sarcoma. Now about 10% of the AIDS diseases in this country. And that's a cancer on the skin and op most, in most cases actually in the lung. It's a lung cancer and I tell you in a minute where it comes from. Likewise, lymphoma is a cancer of the blood system. Dementia and wasting disease is just weight loss similar to anorexia or cachexia and cancer. Those diseases have nothing in common with immune deficiency. They can be paralleled by it, but they are neither caused by immunodeficiency nor consistently associated with it. There are AIDS patients who have Kaposi sarcoma and normal T cells. There are AIDS patients who have dementia and normal T cells. That's sometimes changes with time, like everything with time, but that is not their primary diagnosis. So even if this hypothesis were right, um, a good number of AIDS diseases, 40% in America, 39% accurately, cannot be explained by this hypothesis either. Or by the, cannot be predicted by the virus, even if we knew how it would kill T cells. Go ahead the next one for the predictions. Let me see, we have one more. Well, here's something I don't know whether I would want to go through it with you or not. See, the, I would, we discussed on the porch last night, unfortunately too long, what have, has happened to virology since AIDS. And I would say the original sin almost that was committed that made it all possible to link viruses to anything these days, from Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease and Alzheimer's to AIDS and breast cancer and, and, and pneumonia and, and anything, you can link to virus now, and it is, it is done by changing what we call the latent period, allowing a latent period, a, literally an arbitrary latent period. You get infected today, and anything that's going to happen to you in the next 10, 20, 30, or 50 years of your life is blamed on my virus. Is that, is that scientifically possible? And here is what I'm saying. This is the original sin. 
when that became acceptable. That became acceptable because a famous American researcher again got the Nobel Prize for so-called slow viruses 20 years ago at the NIH, or 21 years ago. Carlton Geidoschek I'm talking about. He presumably discovered the cause of Kuhl, Kreuzfeld, Jakob, and Alzheimer's by finding so-called slow viruses. The idea was so immensely popular among virologists and scientists that it was accepted. <coughs> But these viruses, he had difficulties in finding. Uh, he has the Nobel Prize, but he hasn't found one of those viruses since then. And many people have helped him looking for it. They haven't found them. But the name stuck that viruses could be slow. But can a virus be slow? Virologists can be slow, but viruses, can they also be slow? And I tell you, that isn't possible. They cannot. Because the time, the so-called incubation period, the time from infection to a disease, is not a dark box, it's not a mystery, it is determined by one thing only, and that is the generation time of the virus. The generation time of the virus is the turnover, the virus going into the cell, replicating and coming out of it. And that is a very fixed number. It's like 24 hours on a day. You can add a few minutes or subtract a few minutes, but you can't change that very easily. That's a very difficult thing to change. That's a total fixed. And this is true for viruses, replication. The replication time of HIV happens to be a day or two. During that day, an HIV virus would infect the cell. Let's say this is the, the party day today. You forgot your condom and your clean needles at a party, and you got infected by just one virus. So 1,000 sexual contacts, that's what the average is it takes, unprotected contacts. Let's say you got those infected. Now, 24 hours later, you have produced this one infected cell in your body has now produced 100 viruses. 24 hours later, again, or say 48, give it the longest latent period possible. It's 100 times 100 viruses. And then two days later, it's again 100. It takes only 14 days. It's 100 to the 14 divided by two days in order to reach the number 10 to the 14. 10 to the 14 HIVs, viruses would be produced within two weeks out of one virus. That's the exponential cause of a virus in an unprotected collection of human cells. You are now 10 to the 14 human cells. If you were an Earl Meyer full of human cells, this could be done, could be arranged, you could be trypsinized. We would take your cells apart, dissociate them with an enzyme, and then put them in a Lush Earl Meyer and trump in one HIV, and we keep it warm at 36 degrees. We promise we take good care of your cells. <laughs> Within two weeks, every one cell in this Elmeyer would be infected by HIV if it could be infected by that virus. That's why the incubation period of that virus should be in that ballpark. I grant you, if it is in a human body, it's not as easy as in Elmeyer. There are membranes and there are barriers and there are antibodies and there's interferon. All of these would slow it down. And if you are an otherwise healthy individual, in fact, the, in the, the immune system catches up with most viruses before they even reach significant numbers, it can kill enough cells to cause any symptoms whatsoever. Then you have an asymptomatic infection. But let's say you had no immune system, you should be dead within two or three weeks. But that has been changed by the AIDS researchers because it simply doesn't happen. There are a million Americans HIV positive ever since we know the virus, but most of them are rather healthy, unless they are also fast-track homosexuals or IV drug users nothing is going to happen to them. The World Health Organization now counts the HIV positive citizens on this planet as 18 million. 18 million are HIV positive for 10 years and altogether a million in 10 years have developed so-called AIDS defining diseases. 17 million have HIV for, for 10 years now, are long-term survivors and have no disease whatsoever. <laughs> that can't be explained in, anything, in everything we know about this virus and everything we ever will know about this virus. Because the generation time is not going to change no matter how many billions of dollars you pump into it. It's going to be that way. This is why every doctor can tell you today, if you've ex been exposed to a measles or a flu or a herpes patient, today, within two or three weeks, you're going to have the disease or you're going to come home lucky. If you come from the rainforests in Africa with Dustin Hoffman and you're welcomed by the CDC in New York, they lock you up for two weeks in quarantine because otherwise you will infect the nation with the deadly killer virus. If within two weeks you have not developed Ebola, they turn you loose again <coughs> because they know damn well this is how viruses behave. They grow exponentially. If, if nothing has happened in two weeks, then you are safe. 
because you will not replicate that virus and will not spread that virus. If you came from Africa and had a wild party with a gorilla who is HIV positive, <laughs> which is actually what the story is, then you should actually be locked up for an average of 10 years on Ellis Island before they would turn you loose again to move down to uh, wherever the Castro District in San Francisco to continue your parties. <laughs> that apparently hasn't been done uh, because uh, it, would, it, it would require even larger prison facilities than we have now. All right, can I have the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. so, so here's what, this is how the exponential curve would go. This is days after infection. This is number log of infected cells. Once you have reached 10 to the 14, you can't reach anymore. That's the number of cells in the human body. The disease should occur then. A slow virus is, a, is, a, is, a, is an artifact to match a past virus infection with a future disease that you want to blame on that virus. There's no explanation for it whatsoever. Nothing scientific is there to explain what's happening in those 10 years. They're trying very, very hard, but they have not been able to come up with anything. Could I have the next one, please, Dan? Um, I already mentioned that, that the virus causes a specific disease. I think we can skip a number of slides now. What I would like to do now is, that's okay, if you could skip about six or eight at least. Um, if this is so, let's assume then, since the virus hypothesis, this is how a disease spreads and so on, makes no, no verifiable predictions. All of these predictions that we test, it fails the acid test of a scientific hypothesis. Um, I'll skip over this too, another three or four. And, and the, the uh, failure to make verifiable predictions is the classical indicator of a flawed hypothesis. That is, then it's time to look. Um, that's another cute one I wanted to show you. They say, they also predict that AIDS is going to follow in America or in the world the dissemination of HIV. But here's how HIV, well, let's first look how AIDS distributes in this country. It has risen steadily, not exponentially, didn't explode, but from a few dozen AIDS cases in 1980 to now 75 to 80,000 annually. So AIDS has gone up, it hasn't exploded. As a seasonal flu or a seasonal infection would have gone up like this, up and down, like a bell-shaped curve. This goes up slowly, say like lung cancer did after the war when people picked up smoking like crazy. It went up slowly, no immunity was built up, it was restricted to smokers. Liver cirrhosis has gone up slowly over centuries by now. The more uh, schnapps people consume, the more um, it is, and, it, and it, it creeps up slowly, no immunity is built up. An occupational disease is how this behaves epidemiologically. And here's HIV. They say, well, HIV is the cause of it. In America, ever since the test is available, thanks to Dr. Gallo in the National Institute of Health, a million people were positive as early as in 1984 and 85. And now in 94, this ends at 92 right now, but in 94, one million Americans are HIV positive. There is no correlation between the epidemiology of HIV and AIDS. One is, is slowly increasing, this one is completely unchanging, very steady distribution. <laughs> now, as, as I said, if nothing, if nothing, if, if no prediction is, if the virus hypothesis cannot make a prediction, it's likely to be a flawed hypothesis and we have to look for an alternative. But then people ask, well, isn't the virus always a bad thing? A virus can't be good, it got to do something. Well. Here I have a surprise for you, and this should be one or two slides further down. The majority, just uh, flip a few more, I'm sorry, I should have probably thrown a few more. The majority of viruses in the human, uh, just further again, uh, it's uh, um, what we, and in human, in the, again, a few more. Let me see, I, sh oh God, I should have taken some of these out, because no, uh, still a few more. Um, no, here. Yes, here it is, that was it, okay. Uh, um, uh, the majority of viruses in, the, in humans and animals are, virus, are, are not there to kill you and not there even to cause a disease. They're what we call a passenger virus. A virus that is in there for the ride but has no say whatsoever. It's very much like a passenger in an, air pl in an airplane. The passenger doesn't determine the time of departure, the direction of the flight, and the arrival time. It's just sitting in there. And how do we tell a virus causing a disease from one that is a passenger? One criterion is the passenger virus, the infection, the time of infection of the passenger virus and the occurrence of the disease are totally unconnected, disconnected. One has nothing to do with the other because the virus doesn't cause the disease, 
the time when it boards the human body or the animal is, is irrelevant to the onset of a subsequent disease, any disease. So it's like, again, like the passenger and, and the airplane. You can, you can sit in your jet today, a jet that is going to leave a week from now to New York. That doesn't affect anything about the flight. If you're sitting there, good for you or bad for you, not, you're not going to miss that flight, but it doesn't affect the schedule of that airplane. If you are a causative virus, then you essentially the pilot. When you go in, then soon the thing will take off. But if you are a passenger, it doesn't affect it at all. You could be there early, you could be there on time, you could miss the flight, the flight would go irrespective of your behavior. And so it is for viruses. A virus that has no predictable time between infection and disease, is that's a criterion of a passenger virus. So HIV can infect you today, and if you get sick within the next 10 or 20 years, or tomorrow, that the time is unpredictable because the virus is not causing disease. HIV meets that criterion perfectly. And there are many viruses like that. Epstein-Barr virus infects you today, and you may get a leukemia 20 years from now, 20 Burkitt's lymphoma, as I said, and that some people blame it on this, although that, blame has been that claim has been retracted. It's a passenger virus because it doesn't, the infection and the occurrence of the disease are disconnected. And another equally critical criterion to distinguish a passenger virus from a causative virus is what the virus does during the disease. All viruses cause disease by knocking out a significant percentage of the cells in the human body. So let's say it's a lung-specific virus like flu. It knocks out 20 or 30 percent of the epithelial cells in the lining of your lung at a given time. They have to be replaced, but while they are knocked out at a rate that exceeds the normal regeneration time, if you knock out more cells than the body can afford to re or can, can spare or regenerate during the course of the disease, then you have a disease. So the virus has to be very active and abundant when it's causing a disease. If it remains in low numbers, then you have an asymptomatic infection. Well, HIV fits that criterion exactly of a passenger virus. There are AIDS patients in which no virus has ever been found. It's totally absent. It didn't show in the flight. There are mostly AIDS patients in which the virus can barely be found, only antibodies. It is extremely expensive and difficult to find virus. And there are very few AIDS patients, at least in the literature, in which they say the virus was actually active and there was a relatively high titer. Although, as I said, Gallo, in three years of trying, never met such a patient, and many other leading AIDS researchers didn't either, but they claim now there were some in which the titer is high. So the activity of the virus has no rel uh, relationship to the, to, the, uh, to the disease. In most AIDS patients, the virus is latent, in some it is active, in others it's totally absent. You will never see that with tuberculosis and tubercle bacillus, with hepatitis virus and hepatitis. Whenever you have a disease from that respective microbe, the microbe is abundant, very active, and killing or altering many, many cells. Otherwise you wouldn't get the disease. So HIV then meets all the criteria, the classical criteria of a passenger virus. The time between infection and disease is unpredictable. The activity and the presence in the disease, likewise, are totally unpredictable. That's what a passenger virus, that's how we tell a passenger virus from one that's causing disease. So now then, to the cardinal question, is if, if AIDS is not infectious, what then could cause AIDS? And if I could skip a few, few more slides, I submit to you today that AIDS is not an infectious disease. Uh, let's skip that too. This is more on a passenger virus. Um, the oh, well, that's the definition. We skip that. Let's we have done. Here, here it was. That I'm sorry. That slide. If I could have that. Um, hardly anybody remembers that until 1984, AIDS was considered in this country by the Centers for Disease Control and independent researchers as one of two possible diseases, either caused by recreational drugs um, like uh, well, I see, maybe, oh, I get it. Recreational drugs, and this was because virtually all early AIDS patients, and as I submit to you now, virtually all AIDS patients now are either intravenous drug users or long-term users of recreational drugs 
sexual stimulants like nitride inhalants, amphetamines, cocaine, speed, phenylcycladine, LSD and others. And therefore the, we, we had what's, what was then called the lifestyle hypothesis that this was due to AIDS and the other competing view that won out was an infectious agent was the cause of AIDS. Now, and on the next slide I'm submitting to you that actually the first hypothesis was right and I'm essentially just rediscovering I'm not original at all, although I'm being, being given credit for the lifestyle hypothesis now for the talk hypothesis. They always say Duisberg hypothesis. It was the CDC's very own hypothesis 10 years ago. And i postulating that AIDS is caused in the United States and Europe by the long-term consumption of recreational drugs and ACT, the very drug prescribed against it. This hypothesis, as you will see, explains everything about AIDS Makes, makes AIDS an, an entirely preventable epidemic and allows even the cure of some AIDS patients depending on where they are in the depletion of their T cells or other cells in their body. The remaining AIDS cases, the hemophiliacs, the transfusion recipients and a few cases from non-risk groups like say Kimberly Begalis, the patient of the doctor in Florida, are the normal incidence of these diseases under a new name. The, none of these AIDS diseases is new. Pneumonia, diarrhea, dementia, weight loss, fever, all of these occurred even in 20 to 45 year old Americans, although at a very low rate. What's perceived as the AIDS epidemic is not that these diseases are new, but that these diseases occur above their normal background in a, in a special set, subset of the American population and these are mostly 20 to 45 year old men and a few women. <coughs> That's what's perceived as the AIDS epidemic. They do not ever claim that it's a new disease, although it's, uh, it's presented that way in the news media. If you really check the definition, none of the diseases is new. So these diseases affected hemophiliacs and transfusion uh, recipients all along, but their, ins their mortality, as I pointed out, for hemophiliacs has in fact decreased. And same is true for other transfusion recipients it has decreased or stayed roughly the same since HIV is around. The only thing that has increased is male homosexuals and hemophiliacs. And African AIDS, I submit, is the consequence of traditional African problems, malnutrition, <coughs> parasitic infection, and poor sanitation. That has been a long-standing problem there. That is the cause of African AIDS, and that's why it's equally distributed between the sexes. So here's some evidence to document this hypothesis, the lifestyle hypothesis. We have both chronological and epidemiological overlaps between drug use and AIDS. The drug use epidemic in America and Europe is the only new health risk that this country has faced since World War II. Remember, our life expectancy, our health, has increased despite all the ozone holes and the global warming and, and all these warnings. We are getting older and or better, there is only one subset of the population that doesn't be benefit from these ever improving health parameters and that's 20 to 40 year old intravenous drug users and male homosexuals and that's it, period. All others benefit from it. And I will point out here that the drug use epidemic is in fact the basis for the AIDS epidemic. A the AIDS epidemic is just the name for the clinical manifestation of the massively increasing consumption of cocaine, heroin, poppers, nitride inhalants and of course AZT which the medical orthodoxy has contributed to the problem and uh, that is the only reason why we have AIDS. And here we'll see some numbers for that on the next slide. Um, there are, these statistics are hard to come by but the Bureau of Justice statistic reports that 500 kilograms of cocaine were confiscated in America in 1980 and about 100,000 kilograms of cocaine were confiscated in 1990. That number has gone up in the meantime, it has gone up another 30 or 40 percent. In other words, 100 tons were confiscated in 80, only half a ton in 1980, a 200-fold increase in confiscation. And they openly admit they confiscate roughly 10 percent of the good stuff, 90 percent goes in the general population. So the consumption of of cocaine has increased 200 fold in 10 years from 1980 to 1990. The consumption of amphetamines which is a very popular drug and a cheap drug now developed originally in Germany to keep German soldiers fighting day and night and not being afraid of the Russians. The Fuhrer even injected it in the bunker. 
<laughs> and uh, it's uh, actually a very popular drug now also to lose weight and it's a, it's a cheap drug, it's an adrenaline, a synthetic adrenaline, so resembles adrenaline in the structure. That is very popular also now as a sex drug. This is how it's possible you have 20 or 30, to have 20 or 30 partners per night without even getting tired. With, with conventional aphrodisiacs like estrogen and testosterone, you usually fall asleep after one or two partners or three. Or I usually do after the third, third partner. The third partner, I'm getting tired, I guess. But, but not with amphetamine. Mm. So, uh, nitrites, the so-called poppers, which are, have become the token of gay liberation. It's a drug that has been developed originally in England 100 years ago as a treatment against angina. It relaxes smooth muscles and also dilates vessels, so if you have an angina attack, it allows the blood to, so, to flow freely. In the 60s, again, it was discovered as a psychoactive drug. It gives you a high, and at the same time, it relaxes smooth muscles, so it facilitates anal intercourse, and it's for that reason it has become essentially very popular in the gay community. In particular, one, if you want to have 20 partners, you can't wait, mess around, spending time on foreplay. If you take nitrites, you already any time you can have a much faster, higher turnover. And that has gone from 250 million doses were sold in 1980. What's sold now is not known. Uh, they were then banned by the Congress, but nobody takes them serious. They're treated like sort of a minor little thing, although nitrites are actually known mutagens and carcinogens. The FDA is very concerned about them when you put them in a frankfurter to keep the meat red. If you have 10 parts per million in the frankfurter, if you have more than 10 parts per million, you can't sell, sell that frankfurter. If you inhale a milliliter in a disco as an aphrodisiac, and then you have also 10 parts per million, you sh the FDA would tell you you can't be sold on the meat market for another three days. <laughs> but, but wait, but if you say this could, could be a problem, and this could be a problem for people who are using that, then you are labeled a homophobe or communist or fascist, whatever the uh, particular political denominations of the group is. Now, cocaine users, again, difficult to get these numbers, 8 million estimated in 1991, 200,000 are using AZT right now. So here you, you see there's the chronology I'm trying to establish, the increase of recreational drug use, and now also AZT since 87, in this country, correlating with the increase of AZT. And now, who is taking these drugs? Let's have a look at the next one or two slides. Okay, here's some further increases, methamphetamines, just published a half a year ago, but let's just skip this. Uh, we already made the point that the drug use is increasing. And you remember here, I try to collect AIDS with HIV. HIV doesn't move, but AIDS increases. And here you look, this is the increases in cocaine consumption and cocaine-related hospital emergencies. These curves parallel exactly, but this has nothing to do with it. Next one, please. Now here we see who is using these drugs. For once, the Centers for Disease Control is helpful. They point out the third of all Americans who have AIDS, and that's about 180,000, are intravenous drug users. They've injected drugs for an average of 10 years, which they call the latent period of the virus. During that latent period, the host is very busy injecting three or four times a day street drugs like cocaine, heroin, and combinations of this. Homosexuals who make up the biggest segment in the AIDS risk groups, or in the AIDS patients groups, they are, um, they are users of recreational drugs orally. They don't inject them, they inhale them or pop them, and I dem demonstrate in a second. And now we have a huge reservoir of future AIDS patients, about 200,000 people every six hours take a chain terminator of DNA synthesis as a prophylaxis against AIDS or as a treatment of against when they're HIV positive, owing to Sam Poder from the National Cancer Institute and Burr's Welcome and so on. Okay, here I give you some more numbers, in particular on this one. That one is what you what people question and say, I'm just homophobe, I'm against homosexuals. And here is, this is from Jaffe, director of HIV AIDS research now at the CDC in 1983, one year before the birth of Christ, that is Gallo announcing HIV as the cause of AIDS. At that time, science was still free. He was then investigating, believe it or not, the lifestyle hypothesis. 170 male homosexuals at risk for AIDS, 50 already had AIDS, were, were investigated for possible causes of AIDS. And here's what these 170 men reported as regular, self-reported use, not scientifically tested, self-reported recreational drug use. The list is staggering. It's 
mind-boggling. 96% were using nitride inhalants regularly, 30 to 50% ethyl chloride, 56% cocaine, amphetamines, phenylcyclidine, LSD, metaquilone, barbiturates, marijuana, and heroin. So these percentages are, you see, they add to several hundred. So they were using these drugs in combination. These persons were walking pharmacies. And when we ask why did they get sick, we are looking with the polymerase chain reaction for one gene of the deadly virus in 1,000 cells. And then it's published in Nature, Science, and faithfully reflected in the New York Times as cause of AIDS. Next slide, please. Has that changed? Well, it hasn't, see, and it shouldn't have changed. Because, and who is responsible for that? I mean, in fact, I'm not even blaming those people who are using the drugs for it. The mo people who are mostly responsible is, are the Surgeon General and, and the Medical Orthodoxy. Because they educate people, drugs are harmless. They don't say it exactly that way, but almost that way. They say, as long as you wear a condom and you use a clean needle, you can inject anything you want. We are no cops. We just want to be concerned about your health. You can go and check and take any of these talks as long as you wear a condom and as long as you use clean needles. That's the message that comes across from the medical orthodoxy. And here is what's happening. The, uh, there's a study from 1990 from the Centers for Disease Control on gays at risk in San Francisco, exactly the same drug use. A paper, two papers appearing in 93 in Nature and the Lancet refuting the drug hypothesis once more, commissioned by Nature and the Lancet, showing that every single one of those 215 or 136 men who had AIDS in Vancouver and San Francisco, all of them had used on the average three or four drugs. But they, since they had also HIV, people claimed HIV was the cause of the disease. Go to the next one, please. Now, what are these drugs doing? Here, the toxicity of cocaine and heroin is not, is not clearly studied, mainly because people don't ask the question. You see, science is essentially what you is, is, base, is driven by theory. If there's nobody thinking that drugs would cause AIDS, five minutes, okay, then of course you wouldn't study that. So, but cocaine and heroin work actually indirectly. A, it costs you $100 a day to maintain a habit. B, you won't sleep. C, you won't make T cells if you don't eat because people don't eat, they don't want, they're not interested in food, they eat some junk food and want more more drugs. And worldwide, the leading cause of immune deficiency is malnutrition. Then nitride inhalants are classical mutagens, carcinogens, and I give you some, well, uh, and they have, that's why they have been regulated by the FDA, and now comes AZT, which is used by 200, could I have the next one, please? 200,000 now. This is a chain terminator of DNA synthesis designed 30 years ago for chemotherapy, to, call, to kill growing cells in the body cancer being the fastest growing cells typically. Therefore, that's how chemotherapy works. You kill everything growing for a while and hope the cancer dies before the patient dies. That's, uh, it's, rati it's rational, but not very sophisticated. And here we are applying it with throwing that kind of weapon against the virus that isn't even replicating. It is the equivalent, chemically spoken, of hunting bunnies with neutron bombs. <laughs> you, do, you, you do get the bunnies but the forest also seems to change in the, in the process. Um, here is what you, here, here's how it works. And the next two slides I can show you. Here, these are the four building blocks of DNA. AZT is an analog of cymidine. And all of these have two arms to hold on together to build the chromosome or the nucleic acid that makes up the human genome. This one has only one arm. So when that is incorporated, the chain stops there and the cell is dead or mutated. That's how AZT works. And that's given to these people with HIV, Arthur Ashe, uh, Greg Luganis, Rudolf Nureyev, or Randy Schiltz every six hours. And typically, after a year or two, they look like they came from Auschwitz. And a year later, they're usually gone. And that's what happened to all of those. Nobody has ever been cured with ACT. And it can't be, no matter how good the studies are that have claimed it has helped here and then, uh, it's impossible to, to save anybody who is ch constantly terminating DNA synthesis. All right, uh, here's, I've studied it myself in the lab and ordered, not from Burr's Welcome, they're not my friends from Sigma, it's an old established company in America, 25 milligram of the good stuff, which is advertised by Burr's Welcome, full-time advertisements in the New York Times. You see, a, you see somebody on, with a mountain bike in a spandex suit, and there's a little label there putting time on your side. When you take 
about a gram per day. But if you order 25 milligrams with a PhD or professor in molecular biology, you get a label from Sigma, who's not selling it medically, of course, with the skull and crossbones, pointing out the target is your bone marrow, the source of your T cells, if you still have any. And you, if you feel unwell, please see a doctor and bring this label with him right here. <laughs> bring that to Dr. Fauci. And he's kicking you out of the building in a minute. <laughs> this is 20. At 20 is what they inject now into a pregnant mother who is antibody positive. Into a pregnant mother, say, owing to Dr. Fauci and the, la the leading AIDS researchers in this country. But they don't buy it from Sigma, of course. They get that stuff then from Bruce Welcome. All right, with a different label on it, of course. Yeah. Same material inside. So, yeah. So the Torque hypothesis predicts everything about AIDS exactly. AIDS is going to be restricted to Torque users in America and, and AZT users, and this is exactly what has happened. Could I have the next one, please? And because Torques are causing it, AIDS is predominantly male in America because the Bureau of Justice Statistics tells you that 80% of the heart recreational drugs are consumed by men. Women are far behind. It's a bit like smoking in the 50s and 60s. Women were behind. But they didn't prove to be any smarter. They have caught up now and have as much lung cancer as men. In recreational drugs, the same thing is happening. Men are the primary users, but the fastest growing group, as the CDC always points out now in AIDS, is women. And if you ask the Bureau of Justice uh, Statistics, the fastest growing group of injecting recreational drugs are, again, women. They don't talk to each other about what that does, but they report that. And male homosexuals are the only sexual persuasion that uses drugs consistently. Others use it here and then, but the plumbing with heterosexuals doesn't necessitate drugs. But for heterosexual, for homosexual sex, anal intercourse, it helps in many cases to use these drugs to facilitate uh, anal sex. So this explains the maleness of AIDS in America and Europe. Drug use by, by intravenous drug users, primarily men, and homosexuals, uh, only men. So and, and one or two more, and we have it uh, all. The pediatric AIDS, 80% of the babies with AIDS in this country are born to mother injecting drugs during pregnancies. The uh, drug statistics just released 200,000 mothers in this country are using uh, injected drugs during pregnancies and all, of, uh, and all the AIDS babies are born by them. These are junkies before their first birthday. Next slide, please. It predicts why American AIDS is new. The drug epidemic, as I documented, is new in this country. There were a few cocaine users 30 years ago, but the mass consumption of cocaine, heroin, poppers started in the 70s and has gone up ever since. Next one, please. AZT is new. Uh, only a small fraction of drug users, there are many more than those who get AIDS. Well, that has to do with the lifetime consumption. There are 50 million smokers in this country, but only 400,000 lung cancers per year. Only those who have smoked most and longest will get irreversible diseases. The same with AIDS. Could I have the last, I think, one or two more? We have specific diseases in specific risk groups. Kaposi is almost never diagnosed in anybody but homosexuals. Those who inhale nitrites as aphrodisiacs. They have lung cancer and Kaposi on the skin. It's a carcinogen. Could I have a next one, please? I'll skip that one. And the last, there's an, all these non-correlations between HIV and AIDS can be resolved. We have thousands of HIV-free AIDS cases because drugs are causing them. We have long-term survivors, 17 million, because HIV doesn't cause AIDS. And perhaps the last and only truly promising is on the next slide. No, I skipped that one. Did we go backwards now? OK, here, no, maybe next one. Give, the, give this one here. Yes. Here, if this is true that drugs are causing AIDS, we have in fact a very positive message. AIDS could be easily prevented simply for educating for once for the true causes of AIDS. If you would tell people drugs are causing AIDS, uh, people would could, uh, could make adjustments. They could even not use these drugs. And this is exactly what some people have already done. Here's a group of British homosexuals who call themselves Continuum. They question the virus hypothesis, have stopped using recreational drugs. And in one and a half years, now two and a half years, 1,000 men, not one of them developed the AIDS disease, and their T cells are going up. There is a group published by Wolberding from San Francisco. This is now the placebo group of one of his large AIDS trials. People who didn't get ACT, they didn't know it. 29% oh, sorry, 29 of these 1,000 men, their T cells increased continuously during two years, simply for not getting ACT. So you can recover from AIDS if 
you do it if you start withdrawing these drugs in time. And I think there's one more uh, subset to this slide, and then I stop. Well, here's one. Uh, the best example that the drug hypothesis works are babies. Babies born to mothers who are intravenous drug users are forced to withdraw from drugs when they are born. Then they get transient AIDS diseases, 80% of them recover. Their T cells go up as they are away from the mother because they don't get recreational drugs anymore. So the drug hypothesis makes AIDS a preventable disease. By banning ACT, 200,000 lives could be saved, and we could save, in addition, about $20 billion. Seven and a half billion which are paid for AIDS, in a, that is for treatment and study of the diseases caused by drugs, and $13 billion which are paid for drug control, supply control. Those could be, I wouldn't say reduced to nothing, but significantly reduced uh, just for educating people what drugs are actually doing. It could be easily as successful as the anti federal anti-smoking program, which reduced smoking from about 100 million to 50 million people in 15 years' time, simply for putting labels on this package of the cigarettes. Thank you.